Good morning and welcome to Jew in the City Speaks with your host, Allison Josephs, also known as Jew in the City. We, I started Jew in the City really to talk to um, people outside the Orthodox community. I, I started it to talk to people how, who were raised like how I was growing up, which was proud to be Jewish, but um, having a lot of negative ideas about the Orthodox Jewish community. Um, along the way, we saw that non-Jews were listening to and it was improving their perception of the Orthodox community. That's awesome. And then we saw a lot of Orthodox Jews also following along. Um, some who were just getting chizuk, uh, strength, you know, sort of uh, more strength to uh, stay Orthodox and people who were raised Orthodox and had a negative experience. Um, but an interesting thing that happened sort of the course of this, you know, entity nonprofit, because I started Jewish City in 2007, is that I've gotten a chance to broaden my um, knowledge of the Orthodox community. I've gotten a chance to hear from people from broader experiences than I knew about. I would put myself in the right wing modern Orthodox community. Um, and I always had friends in a variety of different communities, but through Jew in the City, I got to meet people from uh, different walks of life. Um, in some ways, I learned that things were better off in some areas than I thought. In other ways, I learned that things might be worse off than I thought. But it certainly has given me a more nuanced um, sort of perspective of the Orthodox experience. Um, we speak a lot about the Makom stories, the people in our community that have been hurt, um, because there's so much of this in the news, um, in media, about the negative stories that not only are we healing people at Makom and helping them separate dysfunctional experiences from what actual Judaism or Hasidus is about, um, we think it's important to put that nuance out to the world um, so they can understand that when they see these negative stories, these are really, you know, the abusive and dysfunctional cases and not what it means to be normative or mainstream uh, Hasidic or Orthodox. But what happens also along the way, um, as we're putting out these stories, we hear sometimes from people in the Hasidic world who say, hey, I want a chance to tell my story. Um, what I see in the media doesn't represent me at all. Um, and we think it's so important to give voice to uh, different perspectives. Um, and on that note, we uh, would love to introduce you to uh, one of our listeners, one of our fans. Um, she's a Satmar woman from Brooklyn. Her name is Goldie Gutman, and she wants to talk a little about what her life is like um, and how it differs from what you might see on TV or on Netflix. So Goldie, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. This is so exciting. Hi. So, and so just to give a little bit of context here. So um, Goldie works in marketing. You're a mother of a few kids. Yes. Um, and um, so tell me um, what, you know, I think the thing that I find super annoying is that there's this notion that Orthodox Jews or Hasidic Jews um, can't be part of their representation because those people don't even know what media is. So um, can you clarify that? Um, you know, I guess maybe start us back. Like, where did you grow up? Have you always been Satmar? Like sort of what's the sort of the Jewish background growing up? Okay, so I'll start at the beginning and then, you know, we'll end up where, at, you know, talking about today and, and what's relevant to the listeners today. So basically, I grew up in Borough Park. I, my father is Satmar Hasid. He, you know, daven in their shul every Shabbos. We very much um, kept all the minhagim of Satmar. I don't look necessarily like a typical, classic, stereotypical Satmar Hasidish lady, and I, I know that, and I acknowledge that, and I'll talk about that. But my childhood growing up was very much Hasidish childhood. I went to Hasidish elementary school, and um, you know that was that was my life. I, I, but within that, even within the Satmar community, even within the microcosm that is the Hasidish bar park community, there are so many nuances that you have no idea of until you're actually in the in that world. And I didn't even realize it was a nuance until I grew up and I was exposed to other, you know, ways of life and other ways to be a from Jew. So very much I was sheltered. I thought that, you know, what does it mean to be from? It means to be Hasidish, like there was no other way. But even within my from world, there was people, there were people who were, you know, more Hasidish, looked a certain, you know, a certain way, wore maybe something that would be classified as more, you know, Hasidish than me or less Hasidish than me. And that's the way that I grew up. I ended up um, going to Bisakov High School in Bar Park. And I ended up meeting, you know, girls who were yeshivish, girls who were, you know, more modern, more from, um, and weren't Hasidish. And it kind of opened up a whole world to me. I'm like, oh yeah, you know, look, there's all different kinds of walks of life, but still 
I was very sheltered without knowing it because I was still only exposed to, you know, it was a maybe a diff few different kinds of, of from Jews, but all still very um, Orthodox, very from. Um, I got married pretty soon after. My husband is not Satmar, but he's from a Hasidus that is like an offshoot of Satmar, I guess you could say. What and is it? It's called Kavuna Salev. It's like a small, they follow a Rav in Bar Park and, um, you know, it's a small shul, small congregation, but... Every time I think I've heard of every type of Hasidus, there's always a new one for me to learn. So it's still it, it's not really a Hasidus, but it's, a, you know, they're, they're Hasidish and that they follow a Rav, but it's not, he's not a Rebbe. So I guess you can call it a Hasidus, but um, definitely a lot of them in Hagim are, they call it Satmer Gestimt. It means it's coming from Satmer. So mm -hmm. meaning that like a lot of these people, maybe their, you know, grandparents were Satmer and then they just, you know, formed their own little congregation and with their own little um, customs, but a lot of them are following Satmer. Um, and would you call that kind of Heimish? Is that sort of Heimish ish or not really? Hasidish, Hasidish. Really still Hasidish. Yeah. I'm so still, I still try to understand and I still feel like no matter how much, but there is, clarify if I'm wrong, wouldn't some people that have some sort of Satmer or sorry, Hasidish Minhagim, but are a little bit more open or modern, classify themselves as Heimish? Am I getting that wrong? No, you're not getting that wrong at all. So I think Heimish, I would classify as uh, very niche. It's where maybe like your father or grandfather was Hasidish. So you still have some Hasidish minhagim, but you yourself are not really Hasidish. Like you don't follow a rabbi, but maybe you sing mirrors at your table. You know what I'm saying? So it's, you know, maybe you have a beard, but you're not wearing a shramo. So it's it's very, it's like a little bit of a mix. Got so, it. Oh, yeah. But it's, okay. um, I'm telling you again, like I laugh when I, when I talk about it, because to me, it's like so every day and I, I'm so used to it. And I know exactly like, if, you, if I see someone, I'll know if they're Heimish, I know, I don't know if they're Hasidish, I'll know if they're Litvish, but I know that for people that are not from here, it's, we're all one, you know, category, which is exactly why I get so frustrated when I see us all lumped together and, you know, in, in when we're portrayed in the media, in TV shows or whatever it is. So, Got it. Uh, okay. And so that's sort of, that's sort of your, your from background growing up. Um, the, the way that we see, um, and I guess I, what I want to try to say, and again, is to sort of continue with the nuanced conversation. Your experience doesn't invalidate someone that had a different experience that had, you know, a more right wing, a more left wing, um, a more abusive, like meaning those other experiences can still exist um, while you t share your story and your perspective on life. And what I've learned from the Monaco members is that for so many of them, unfortunately, their family situation, their school situation, it was just sort of abuse on top of abuse on top of abuse that there could be someone literally living on their block that they never interacted with that had such a healthier upbringing. And so they were right there and yet they were worlds apart because the people that the Mako members were surrounded by were really just only a dysfunctional type and sort of a, a school with, you know, such rigidity and no room for anything but exactly what they expected. And so there could literally be someone just a few doors down that had such a vastly different experience, a world apart and yet like right there. So um, I will say that like the, front, the, the community here in Bar Park, it's not utopia. I'm not going to go, I'm never going to be the one to say, oh no, if someone has a negative experience here, it can't be true. It has to be that they're making it up. They probably have a vendetta against us. Never. But I will say that it's not utopia, but it's definitely not, um, you know, Gehenna either. It's like, right. there's definitely like something in between. <laughs> so what, um, so I think what we see a lot of themes of in media when we see um, Orthodox or Hasidic women depicted is they don't have a voice, um, they're being controlled, um, they don't have any education, they don't have any ability to have anything to do extracurricular. Do you have ex life experiences that would, um, counter that that different from what we've seen in the media like what have you seen that they've gotten wrong that you would say personally okay, you've so, personally? So I, I can see why they would get that perception when they're looking at the from community and they're looking at how you know all the this you know people who are speaking for the community are male and you don't really hear from from women and you you know especially not Hasidish women and I can understand and I will say that there are limitations it's not that I can go and I can just you know be you know like speak up and and just be someone that's going to be way out there. I, but I choose this life and I choose to be this way. And it's not that I'm forced and I, I can have a job and I have a job and I am, you know, out there in the world and I have friends and I have such a full and vibrant and wonderful life within the parameters, you know, of the Hasidic life here. So 
it's possible to point out that you are speaking right now. Like you did, you know, we did uh, communicate. You did say you wanted to sort of give your piece and so say your piece rather. Um, and not every, you know, Hasidic woman out there would, you know, come onto a video and, and tell their story. But you obviously were raised with the confidence that you have a message and, you know, th there's a platform and you want to share it. So that in and of itself, whether or not, meaning I also wouldn't get up and like lead services in a synagogue and read from the Torah. I did that in my pre-Orthodox life. And, you know, it was just my son's bar mitzvah this past Shabbos. And I saw my daughter so proud of him and they had a very different role for their bat mitzvahs. And I was trying to figure out like, what did we give them exactly that they didn't feel the need to do what their brother did and they don't feel shortchanged like that? And I think it's because they feel seen, they feel heard, they feel special. They both spoke during the bar mitzvah throughout the weekend and shared beautiful words of Torah. Um, we've given them a sense that um, they just feel confident and loved and are able to shine in their own ways. And they respect the sort of the parameters of our lifestyle as sort of bigger and more important than, you know, sort of getting the chance to do everything exactly the same. The idea of sort of continuity of the Jewish people and a, a way of life that is according to halacha and according to tradition so that it should continue. That's so much bigger than them saying, I need to be exactly like what my brother did. That's just my experience. I don't, do you have any thoughts on sort of like what yeah, that no, means? I'm happy that you brought up examples because I was like, you know, like you're in the moment, you're like, wait, 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 what can't I do? So yeah, exactly. Like I'm not, I'm not looking, I'm not looking to go and hold a Torah and read from a Torah. Like I, I am not, I'm not interested in that. And I, you know what, I think I, a lot of our teachers in, you know, school would kind of like teach us about the beauty of a woman and how the woman is the home and the woman is actually, it's just the opposite from what the media portrays. It's the woman is the essence of the home. The woman runs the home, the, the, w because of women, that's why we've survived until now. That's why the Jewish people are still here. It's because of, of, of us. And just, you know, the fact that, that it's portrayed so the other way where women are, you know, they're making it sound like women are shunned, women are shamed, women are forced. And it's really not like that. Women are so respected and women are, if anything, the crown of the home. So I think I, I want to just now sort of touch on, we keep saying the head of the home. I think we have sort of talked about the fact that the home has been denigrated in large part in the secular world, that um, there's sort of this idea of leave the home, get out of the home, you know, have someone else raise your children. And I'm not trying to uh, shame or criticize working women. I'm also a working woman. I try my best to juggle uh, work responsibilities and home life. And I don't always do it perfectly. And I really do try to do it all. But I think, um, you know, even just the rate of people that are having children are getting married. If you look at the statistics, it is way down. And what sort of the Jewish traditional values say is that when you have a strong home, you have a strong generation. The next generation of the Jewish people are strengthened and confident and loved and, you know, can do great things in the world. And when the home is depleted and there's not really anyone there that's present, that sees you, that hears you, that is there to take care of you, um, then that can really create um, a big vacuum in terms of, you know, each individual person. So, um, yes, we're saying that the woman is, uh, you know, has this high place in the home. Um, the Gemara even says Isha Zubesa, that the woman is the home, which might sound so backwards compared to sort of our progressive th thinking of the secular society now. But what Jewish traditional thought is saying is that unless there is a strong presence there to take care and to nurture, um, there will be serious problems. So, um, yeah, I would totally agree. What about in terms of educational opportunities? Like how, you know, what was your secular education like growing up Hasidish? So my mother was always a big advocate. My mother actually was born in Israel and she moved here when she was about 12. So she wanted us to be very fluent in English and be very, um, very much bookworms, I guess you could say. And she succeeded because my whole family, we all love to read. We got our hands on as many books as we could. We devoured them. And I think through that, we just gained a lot of knowledge about the world. And I would say this for all my siblings, we're all, you know, completely out there, whether we're college educated or not. My sister is a speech language pathologist. I actually have my master's degree. Um, and I think that at this point, it's extremely narrow-minded to say that Hasidic people don't have the opportunity to get higher education because very much so we do. We come out of high school with so much knowledge in the Hebrew subjects, in the English subjects. And personally, college for me wasn't a big deal. It wasn't, I didn't feel like I was at a disadvantage coming from my background. Um, we took our re regions just like everyone else. So I just, I really think that, um, you know, this misconception has to be shot down. Obviously, again, I will say that this is my experience. And if your experience is different, then I'm not going to, 
you know, I'm not going to challenge Validate. it. Give it right. to you, but. Well, also, let's just clarify that you did go to a base Yaakov. And so there is a range of within Hasidish experiences, meaning we have a Mako member from New Square and she saw sort of the Julia Hart and her daughter uh, claim that they didn't learn grammar or history. And, you know, our member said, I learned grammar and history in um, New Square. You certainly did growing up yeshivish. Right. So right. Um, there's certainly a, a range of experiences. And what about, you know, and, and what can I ask what your master's is in? Yeah, um, surprisingly enough, it's in education, but um, okay, I've cool. been in that field for a bit, but now I'm out of it. So, yeah. Um, in terms of um, being able to go to college and getting a master's, that also could differ from family to family, meaning if there's a family that's more open to it, it will be perfectly fine. And there might be a family that would you know, think it's the worst thing ever and make the child think like this is something they can't do. So that could also differ from family to family or school to school. Like, would, would you agree with that? Or are, Yeah, but there are like right now, there's so many programs within the firm community that there's multiple, multiple Hasidic people in there because it's, it's, um, they took basically a college program and they made it, um, so that it was pro, you know, doesn't, it doesn't have classes on Shabbos. They, you know, they're only for women or separated women and men. So they kind of catered it to the from community. And hmm. it's, I mean, my class in college, this is going back years. I had so many really Hasidic girls who were, went to Hasidic high schools and all that. And they were there, they were there getting their hmm. degree. And a lot of them is because they want to be able to support their husbands. And they know that they're going to need that college degree for, you know, for once they get married and they need to support a family. But mm -hmm. on that note, I will say that in on from the men, it's completely different. In the Hasidic world, it's unbelievable how entrepreneurial the men are. They mm -hmm. m most of them are not college educated, but many of them run extremely successful businesses. And this is without their, you know, grammar and and science education and without any higher education. So definitely, you know, that's something to, to look at as well. Mm -hmm. And I would say, look, for that piece, I think if you do well, if you have a head for business and you can do well, I would say probably also in the Sephardic community, not as much college education as in the Ashkenazi modern Orthodox community, for instance. Um, but, you know, certain parts of the Sephardic community are tremendously successful in uh, business. And I don't think you hear people complaining. And it could be also that because they are getting a better secular education. I would just sort of say one point for that, for the person that wanted the secular education or felt like they missed out or feel like they're not doing as well in business. I think that could be, uh, you know, a, a reasonable gripe or, or something that someone wished that they had more access to. Again, I, I'm working with people that sort of feel like they got the short, you know, end of the stick. Um, so that, you know, is obviously coloring my, my perception. And it could be also that when you feel loved and you feel like you have parents that are taking care of you and sort of uh, providing a path for you that it may not feel as um, sort of overwhelming that you can't read English or, or can't spell very well. Whereas if those things are missing, then everything that's lacking um, might just feel that much more extreme. Again, I'm trying to really have this conversation in a careful way where we can both give a space for the people that did okay in how they were raised and the people that felt like it was, uh, not, it was not offending anybody in any way. Like I'm, that's not my intent. Well, I, I think, I, I think it's important to give voice to that. And I'm just, I'm sort of giving voice to the other side because I know people that are watching that missed out on that and feel otherwise um, shortchanged. It is something like, I know, um, I know a guy from a very yeshivish family and he said he didn't leave observance because of the lack of secular education. He left because of his abusive household growing up. He is aware of that. But now that he's out of it, he feels shortchanged that he didn't have those basic skills from school. And he feels like he has a lot more to climb up to now uh, trying to get, you know, a secular education. So um, what about rec recreational types of activities, whether it's sports or arts? Um, you know, we see, again, in unorthodox that she doesn't have access to music, that playing piano was a big deal. Um, that, you know, uh, we see in my orthodox life that, you know, anything recreational and, and athletic, uh, they claim, and it's not true because, I mean, in uh, my in my orthodox life, um, the daughter went to a modern orthodox high school and was literally a sports star of the week for, um, I think, maybe for running and something like that. So um, what, you know, what was available in terms of recreation or, or arts growing up? So again, my experience will, will differ from other people. So I will say that on my end, I was pretty lucky. I, you know, I was exposed to, I was able to take piano lessons. I did, I was exposed to art. If I wanted to take art lessons, I went every Sunday to, you know, a program where they did, you know, all these different kinds of um, recreational activities. Um, I do know that even in the, you know, much more Hasidish camps and schools and whatever, they, they teach you, they teach the girls Tzniyas. They're very into Tzniyas, correct? So Part of the tzniyas is that we are we won't play sports perhaps that 
you know, will, you know, require too much, um, I don't know, like, you know, for them to show their, their bodies too much or throw themselves around too much, but they do play ball. They do dance. They do simcha dancing, which is like, you know, the dancing to the, to the, um, you know, Jewish music. And there's plenty of opportunities, especially in bar park, for recreational activities. There are Sunday programs um, with gymnastics, with um, swimming, and really so many things, painting, um, different kinds of art classes. And everyone has access to this. This is not something that, you know, someone who's more Hasidish won't go to. It's totally acceptable and normal. And it's an opportunity that's available to anybody, really. I mean, if you're financially able to do it, of course. Right. That would say, I would say that's another piece of it, by the way. Also, a lot of people that are coming to Makom come from families that I think struggle a lot more financially. Um, and so anyone that's struggling financially, anyone whose parents can't put together a way to make a living, I think um, is just automatically going to have challenges that someone from a more affluent family is going to miss. Um, you know, we have some therapists that we consult with uh, when it comes to issues around Makom and one of the therapists is a child therapist and she has almost completely Hasidish clientele. And she says that her, she is skewed towards the highest functioning families. And I said, wait, kids in therapy is highest functioning. And she said to have parents that are attuned enough to notice that their kid needs extra help because they're struggling in some way in mental health means they're educated, means they're on top of things, means they can afford it and they're caring and doting. And so she said that she understands that even her perspective is seeing kind of the best of the best. I understand with the Makam, I'm seeing sort of the struggle of the struggle. And, you know, obviously the news and media picks up on the struggles of the struggles. Um, and in reality, um, I would say reality is somewhere in between. Um, and I think that that's the piece that's always missing that we don't. And I think it's so important to give voice to the people that um, lived, you know, happy and moderate um, and, you know, existences where not everything was open and yet, if you feel like you have enough choices and that you get to choose to be a part of this world, then if you choose your own restrictions, then they're not being restricted on you. You're, you're deciding, um, you know, I'm not going to have that piece of cake. I would rather, you know, not gain five pounds. You know, I would rather not um, do X, Y, or Z because I would rather be a part of this tradition. So I think that's really what it comes down to that people that um, are able to choose what they do or don't do, don't feel resentful about it because, um, they're making their own choices. Everything in life comes with a trade-off. Now, if we want to have access to one thing, we have to automatically cut something else off. Um, what about travel? Is that something that I feel like, you know, people kind of think that, you know, Hasidim just kind of stay in Brooklyn all day and can't go anywhere. Is that something that, you know, parts of the community are, are more engaged in? I mean, I'm sure you've seen us in Miami. I mean, come on. <laughs> you've seen Hasidim in Miami. So yeah. no, for sure. I'm saying, you know, go to the Catskills in the summer and there's definitely, you can travel if you want. I think the biggest um, problem with traveling is that a lot of people, you know, they need their minion and they need their, their kosher food. So that's why I would say you probably see a lot of um, Hasidim traveling to Israel and to Florida and to, you know, other larger Jewish communities, because that's where, you know, they can find what they need, even though Chabad is lovely and you can always count to Chabad. But I will say also, the reason that I, I reached out to you originally is because I was so frustrated because something that you said once stuck with me was that most people, most, um, you know, non-Jewish people worldwide have never actually met a religious Jew. And what they have, what information they have from the community is, you know, from the media or from shows that they're watching. And I have just been sent a clip from someone who was, you know, was once religious and then, you know, now is not, and was talking, this person was talking about their experience and the clip had like a few hundred thousand views and many likes and many, many comments. And it really, really frustrated me because I said, why is, why can't I say my story? Why can't I speak and say my truth? And why can't I get 100,000, 200,000, 500,000 people to see this and say, oh, okay, so, they're not all, you know, crazy and oppressed and, you know, living this shunned lifestyle or whatever. A hundred percent. I know. And I think what I'm, we're developing now, if you haven't heard yet, um, we're developing now a Hollywood Bureau of JITC. What we discovered in the last few months is that the Muslim community, the black community under MPAC and NAACP have these Hollywood bureaus where they work with the networks and the studios to create characters from their communities that are nuanced and full characters as opposed to always a villain or a terrorist or a thug. Um, and we realize like we also need these conversations and we need this kind of careful uh, crafting of characters because Yes, we have our abusers and our dysfunctional people like anyone else does. 
And I think it's important to also note that in the cases that they exist in the Orthodox community, probably a lot of it has to do with the Holocaust. We had a major atrocity happen in our community. Almost entirely, um, the Hasidic community is descendants uh, or survivors of, of this trauma more than any other community. Um, and so I think grace should be given um, in terms of, you know, looking at how uh, patterns, you know, of dysfunction start. Um, but yeah, we're talking about a sort of an age of repre representation, fair representation, and you are 100% correct that um, we need to have broader stories told. I mean, we have a whole section on Jew in the City under profiles just for Hasidim to tell these types of stories. And I actually share them with Mako members when they tell me, but this and this and this, I say, check out these stories too. I understand your experiences like that. And that's really painful. And I'm really sorry. Um, but also understand that that's not the only way to be Hasidic. Um, and I think, you know, for the media, for the larger world that says, oh, they don't know, they don't care, uh, they're not watching, um, they really need to understand that there are Hasidim watching, there are Hasidim that are on social media, that are on Netflix, that are watching these movies, that are aware of how they're being depicted over and over again, um, and they're sick and tired of it. Um, and I think also, maybe just for the last two minutes, we have about two minutes left, what about a sense of danger? Do you feel like walking around with a husband in a fur hat, you know, and sort of walking around uh, Brooklyn? Is there a sense that there's a target on your back um, because of sort of how sort of badly the world looks upon you know, the Hasidic community? Right. So really quickly, in, in my little microcosm, in my little, um, you know, environment here at Bar Park, never. No, not really. When, you know, mm -hmm. I would say that my community where I live is 98% in my neighborhood, um, you know, Hasidic Jews. So no, but I will say one interesting story um, about six, seven years ago, I was in Venice for Shabbos and um, with my husband and we were walking in the street and it was in the summer. It was extremely hot and humid. And my husband was wearing his stramo and I was wearing my Shabbos clothes and my wig and all that. The steer that we were getting, but mm. instead of feeling scared, I felt so proud. I can't tell you. I was like, yeah, we're different. Yes, this is this is me. This is my life. This is what I choose. I I'm happy. I felt royal. I felt I really I felt something something very strong there. And I was looking around at everybody, and everyone was literally staring and taking pictures of us. And I'm like, yes, this is who we are. We're Hashem's people. This is how my family chooses to dress. This is our minhag, and I'm proud to do it. I'm happy to do it. Beautiful. Well, I think everyone should carry their head so high. And I think for the people that uh, look at our community and take pictures uh, at the weirdness, uh, would you do that for another religion, another minority, another group dressed in their traditional garb? Um, it's really, uh, it's troubling at the response, but uh, but I love your take on it. And um, thank you so much for, for reaching out. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, I open this up to other people that want a chance to tell their story as well. You know, all we can kind of do is collect these stories one by one. No one has conducted a study of, uh, you know, what percentage are this percentage happy or unhappy. But um, my sense is that um, when there are healthy people uh, living a, a lifestyle with beautiful values, it ends up being a very family oriented and meaningful way of life. And as is the case with narcissists and people with personality disorders and mental health issues, um, those things just kind of ruin relationships and families and lives. And so they will be toxic um, no matter where they occur. Um, so thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And you can catch us same time, same place next week. Bye-bye.